Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Cheryl Selman, and welcome to The Love Code. I'm so pleased you're with us today. This is a program that really has a great purpose, and the purpose is to uplift, inspire, transform, and heal you. How's that for a, uh, a good goal and intention? So this is an opportunity to have conversations with wise spiritually um, aligned, open-hearted people who have a mission in life, and the mission is to serve humanity and uplift humanity. So it's always my great pleasure to have these conversations with wonderful people, and I hope you will be joining me every week to inspire yourself, to keep yourself on the path and, uh, and open to the immense possibilities that exist for all of us. I want to say before we jump into a fantastic conversation today that I have a website, and it's Dr. Cheryl Selman, and I will spell it for you. It's S-H-E-R-R-I-L-L-S-E-L-L-M-A-N. And the reason why I would like you to go and visit my website and opt in there because I send all of the archive shows out to you. If you can't listen live, they'll come right to your inbox. And the other option is to go to my Facebook page, which is What Women Must Know. And What Women Must Know is the name of my other show on PRN. So if you go to either my website or like me on Facebook, you'll get both of my weekly programs. And, of course, you don't want to miss any of them because they are so inspiring, at least I think so. So, okay, I uh, would like to take the opportunity to tell you about my guest today. We're going to be exploring a practical guide for realizing samadhi with Daniel Schmidt. And a little bit about Daniel. He has been practicing meditation and self-inquiry for over 20 years and has been teaching meditation for 10 years and draws on many different traditions in his teachings. Daniel is the creator of the award-winning film, Inner World, Outer Worlds, as well as the ongoing Samadhi series. Most recently, he released a series of guided meditations and teachings as a practical guide to realizing Samadhi. His approach combines self-inquiry with traditional forms of meditation so the participants have the opportunity to simultaneously realize their transcendent nature and to purify themselves of conditioned patterns. The pathless path is to realize an ever deepening development process with the self structure within the self structure and to simultaneously realize what is always already beyond the self structure. Samadhi is when the world that is constantly changing merges or unites with the changeless. Wow. So, uh, first of all, I want to welcome Daniel Schmidt to the show today. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Thanks for having me. Well, you're so welcome, and I, I'm so happy you're here. I, I just want to tell everyone listening why I uh, I have you on the show, <laughs> and and that's because I was browsing through Amazon Prime, looking for a good movie to watch or something inspiring. And there was Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds, right there on my top line. And I, I, I didn't know what it was. It looked really um, interesting, and I just decided to play it. Well, I, I was just mesmerized. There are four episodes. I just went through all four in one night, and it was like, you know, <laughs> putting me into samadhi. Daniel, you did your job. Uh, and then I, I found your Samadhi series, which I said, gosh, this is so interesting. It's kind of just on the same line, same kind of focus and theme as Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds. And then, of course, I saw when I got to the end that you created it. <laughs> so uh, I've been so drawn to what you're doing. And I really hope all of my listeners will find Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds, either uh, it's um, – on YouTube as well as Amazon Prime. It's the most phenomenal creation, Daniel, and that's why I had to find you. I tracked you down mm -hmm. to find out who was this incredible man that made this profound 
just, uh, I mean, it's it's profound. It's like it was channeled. The information is so amazing. And I found you. So I'm so happy that you are here and we're having this conversation today. So I, I just want to thank you for all the hard work you did to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for so, reaching so out and branching out your energy to find me. I can get I can very get determined <laughs> <laughs> when I want to. Um, let's start by uh, having you share your journey. Well, I'm sure I don't know much about your background, so I'm fascinated to learn your story. I'm sure it's a very interesting story that got you to this place and also created a center called the Samadhi Center in, I guess it's Western Ontario. Is it like in the countryside of Ontario, Canada? It is. It's sort of in the middle of nowhere. Um, I don't know if, if listeners know um, Canada very well, but um, there, there's sort of a, a, a big space on the map kind of between Toronto and Ottawa, which are the two main cities. So we're we're kind of in there somewhere. And uh, it's a beautiful pine forest setting here. So, um, so I've been here for about um, 11 years now, and uh, running meditation retreats. And um, it's been a long journey. I, I was just a very, you know, I had had a very normal kind of upbringing, um, kind of middle class family. My parents were teachers, uh, and I just was was very much. Um, just a person in in the matrix, so to speak, um, you know, just pursuing money, um, not, you know, I was working in the television industry, which is, is a bit of a soul-sucking industry, but um, I, I didn't really um, have, you know, any kind of a, a spiritual path or calling, at, you know, in my earlier part of my life, and um, it really wasn't until I... You know, I, I experienced the suffering of, or the, kind of the pointlessness of, of pursuing um, all these things that we typically pursue out, outside of ourselves. And um, so I, I uh, had a, a, um, so a long story, but, um, you know, I basically, something inside me didn't want to be doing um, what I was doing. And you could say my spirit or my, my soul really didn't want to be living the way I was in the city. So um, so I had a health crisis. I didn't listen to the warning signs that um, that it was giving me. And they were they were not so subtle warning signs. Um, but sometimes you, you know, if you don't listen to what's going on in your inner world, then um, sometimes, you know, your your higher self will give you the hammer. So I, I required the hammer to um to really wake up out of out of what what I was doing and uh, I ended up moving out into um um uh, just a little I I basically got a like a little trailer house um my my mortgage was like $200 a month and I I just moved out I just got out of the system and that was my way of just um healing and uh, going into my 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 inner world and um I didn't have to worry about money too much because I was just you know I stripped everything down to its bare minimum and um and that was that was for me sort of the beginning of um a different life and a, a different direction so you kind of left society behind and uh, I guess you were forced to because of your health challenges and being unhappy in the industry you were working in. What happened when you took that time and went into yourself, and I guess, into more silence? Yeah, so the, like the first thing was, um, you know, I, I was, you know, I'd moved out of the city, um, left my business partner, left my my other partner that I lived with. Um, so I was I was just out in the middle of nowhere by myself. And the first thing um, I realized, you know, I, I, I bought a canoe. I had this whole kind of um, idealistic vision of, of how I would heal and, and kind of connect with nature and everything. And so the first thing I realized when I, when I finally got my canoe onto the water was that um, – my mind was completely insane still you know i was i i brought all my stress all my my conditioned patterns out to this new place um so um nature is is a phenomenal mirror to reflect back 
um, the truth about yourself. So, so the first thing I realized was that, um, you know, I'm like, I, I, it wasn't actually my environment that was the problem. It was, it was me. You know, it was my own conditioning in my my mind that was the problem. So, um, so the the first realization was that. Um, you know, I, I have to really take a good look at what's going on in my own mind and and start to um, you know go deep into into whatever it is that I am. You know, really look at what 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 is it that I am that you know this self, this Dan structure that you know I've I've inherited patterns from my family, from my teachers. And, you know, so what what is that thing? Why is it so unhappy? Why is it stressed out? And um, you know, at this this level of agitation. So, um, so you know, my my um, probably the thing that really turned my life around at that point was um, I had a friend who was into uh, vipassana meditation. He would do the uh, the SN Goenka ten day retreats and. Um, he he had just come back from one, and uh, he he was he was glowing like he was he was very alive and um, and uh, and he was telling me all about it and and I thought okay maybe maybe this is something you know I was kind of desperate I didn't really know anything at that point about um, about the mind about meditation I hadn't, hadn't even read a book about it and um, but I but I saw this change in my friend. So I decided to go to do a 10-day retreat without um, without even knowing really what it was. I just I I just desperately wanted the the off button for my mind because um, at this point I had insomnia. I wasn't I I, I wasn't at peace at all. So um, so that was probably the biggest thing. And the the 10-day retreat, you know, I I went there and. Um, you know they teach this this ancient um, vipassana uh, meditation technique and um and it, it was like suddenly i uh, it was like i was home it was like i recognized it immediately as you know as what i needed at that point in my life so um uh so i had um my my first 10 day retreat um i had an awakening experience um and um i don't know if i should go into that at all but it it um oh yes please do <laughs> but I, that, I, yeah i think that's i think we need to you know that's 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 so powerful to hear what happens when you lift the veil yeah so so yeah like you know at that point in my life like i was i was a real left brain person like like my, you know, up to that point in my life, you know, my my path had been to go into philosophy in in um, university, and then I went to law school. So you know, I was I was like totally left brain, and um, so there was, um, you know, having a mystical experience wasn't even on my radar at all, um, it, because you know, I I literally just wanted some relief from my mind. I just wanted the off button. I didn't care how it happened. So, but um, what happened at the retreat was, um, you know, part of the technique. You're, you're really, um, you know, you're, you're um, just coming into the present moment and allowing everything to be as it is. And, and I really took it seriously. I really, you know, at, at that point, my, my feelings inside my body were intolerable. I, I was in a lot. I, I was going through. Um, I had type 1 diabetes as part of my diagnosis, um, rheumatoid arthritis. So um, my, you know, like my bones in my deepest bones, like I was, I was experiencing this incredible pain and ache. Um, so when I when I was doing this practice, um, it was it was excruciating. It pushed me to 100% of what I could tolerate in the moment but i just i just kept surrendering and kept surrendering and um at at a certain point um i think it was it was after quite a few days i think maybe after seven or eight days of of just being you know single pointed in in applying myself to meditation um what what happened was um you know something something gave way and and it was like the uh 
the energy and the pain and everything just sort of merged together with my consciousness and um and it was like everything all all phenomena all sensation just sort of woke up as as my consciousness and in that experience um you know, I I now I have a, have a way of talking about it as a, I I call it a savakalpa samadhi experience. So, it's a, a samadhi with with a seed of of form basically. So there's still phenomena, and and basically I merged with that phenomena, and it was it was unbelievable. It was like um, it was like an ecstatic sort of experience um, where. You know, literally everything I was experiencing was me. Um, so I experienced myself. I remember w- walking along um, the path at the center and and seeing other people and and feeling my own consciousness inside of them. And um, and you know, and I felt the um, just energetically like the chakras were open. So I felt um, you know felt like the power of the universe moving through me and and yet it was it was consciousness it was my own aliveness or my own awareness um so um the thing about uh savakalpa samadhi is that um it's not it's not the final samadhi where one recognizes their true nature so i was at this point in my journey you know i was completely identified with my self structure so you know so the dan character that was having this experience you know i i believed i was that i believe i you know i i thought at that point i was enlightened or i was like the buddha or or jesus walking around <laughs> in the state and i was fully 100 percent identified with that so you can imagine um you know like having having had quite a bit of suffering up to that point and then having this incredible experience which at, at that point i believed you know this is it this is this is what i've always wanted this is the state i i want to be in forever um you know you can imagine the amount of identification with with that um so um so of course um you know my i i wasn't um you know i wasn't at all prepared for this and and of course it was just a state of of samadhi it wasn't it wasn't a permanent stage of samadhi so um so i lost it just as quickly as i got it and um and the the experience of losing it um was you know it was going from being all that is to being basically nothing to being being this little insect like creature again <laughs> and uh and so i felt the the profound loss of that state as well and um and literally wanted to kill myself at, at that point like it it just i couldn't i couldn't tolerate it and it's and it's because my my self structure was just not prepared and i didn't understand that in order to encompass these these higher states um we we need to be at a point in our journey where we can we can let them come and go and without an, without any attachment to them um so that was that was my first big lesson and it, it wasn't until um much much later that i i was able to um really understand and and have um i i had um you know a true samadhi experience where i i realized you know my own the emptiness of the self structure basically and um i realized what it what samadhi actually is 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 um what doesn't come and go it's our it's actually our awareness that is ever present you know so the awareness that was in that first experience it wasn't aware of itself as as it as all that is um so um you know it was it was still sort of asleep and um still um you know the the ego construct was was really um you know what was what was driving my life and and driving the show at that point so um yeah and um you know the 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 real samadhi experience the the nirvikalpa samadhi my first experience of that was 
um, about, I'd say, maybe 13 years later um, when I was at a, a Zen center. And um, and again, I was in a similar sort of situation. And I, I talk about um, conditions of no escape where, you know, we put ourselves in these these crazy sort of uh, um, conditions of, of um, you know, doing these practices. And, um, and you know, uh, the Zen center was even more extreme because um, you, you have to sit very rigid, rigidly still. And it was just a more intense period of, of practice. And, um, and at this time, I'd, I'd been doing a lot of self-inquiry and, um, and uh, um, you know, they part of their tradition. They they teach the Heart Sutra as well. So a lot of the the non-dual teachings were being taught at this this retreat, and um, and I was really really struggling. Like I was really experiencing again a lot of pain, and and uh, you know my my meditation practice was pushing me to about a hundred percent of what I could handle again. And I I remember going to my my teacher there and. Uh, he 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 said um you know you can you can just drop the struggle just recognize who is struggling and and then of course i was struggling to drop the struggle and it, <laughs> and it, and it just became this this absurd um you know i it just it got to a point where i had to either get out of there or or somehow find out how to surrender and um and I realized at a certain point I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't make samadhi happen. The the ego construct or the the dan structure or any any technique, anything that I can do um, was futile. And and, um, and I I gave up basically. I, I completely gave up. But I stayed on the cushion and and I I just surrendered. I. I basically, you know, the the self construct just realized that it it had failed. It, there's nothing it could do, and it it was in that failure, that surrender, that that uh, my my awareness was still there. It was still it, it had always been there, but it it's like it woke up. I realized that you know I'm not that self structure. I'm not. I'm not, um, you know, this this activity of doing, and there was it was in this there was a profound sort of stillness, but it wasn't it wasn't the stillness that you can make happen. It was just almost like the stillness recognizes itself, and um, and it literally is like a waking up, and um, and that stillness is you know. It's everything. It's it's the consciousness that permeates this entire world. It's you know it's been called many things, in many different traditions. You know that um, Krishna consciousness or or Brahman or um, Buddha nature. Um, you know so um, so that for me um, you know that's what I refer to as as. Um, Nervakalpa samadhi. So in that experience, there's a there there was a cessation of of um, the dan activity, the dan um, structure, and um, so it literally stopped. Like there was a there was a stillness um, and nothingness. There was no there was no subjective phenomena um, in in that experience. You know, it wasn't even ex- an experience because there's no experiencer. Um, but yet, there's this something that can't be said, which is awareness itself. Um, so, um, the, in the ancient teachings, they talk about, you know, the gross, subtle, and causal levels. So, the, this would be the causal, the formless level of of our being, um, which we we experience every night. Um, we don't experience it, but we go into it um, in deep sleep. So there, in deep sleep, there's no phenomena. Um, so uh, nervakalpa samadhi is basically identical to deep, deep sleep. There's nothing that can be described except the difference is the awareness is present or the, the I am 
is is present. Um, so there's there's a sense of um, of that um, the eternal awareness. You know, this is what all spiritual traditions talk about, as you mentioned. It, it does, it, you know, in different ways, different languaging throughout time. Mm-hmm. Throughout time, we this was the, this is the eternal truth that yes. all spiritual traditions are pointing towards, which is what our real purpose here is to realize at mm-hmm. some point in our many lives, <laughs> yeah. right, at some point. Yeah. Um, how, how did that change you, and do you still, are, are you still in that place in your life now? Does it come and go? What, mm-hmm. What's the experience for you? So there, yeah, there. that's a good question. So, like, from, I, I always I have to answer a question like that, you know, kind of from the absolute and, and from the relative simultaneously so I'll, I'll do both so from the absolute perspective um, you know what I am as as absolute awareness that that doesn't change it's it there's nothing to change there's no there's no quality to it and um, you know there there's nothing um, that evolves or can be there's no development process that happens with that with that pure awareness so from that perspective you know nothing changes and absolutely nothing changes you don't you don't gain anything um you don't lose anything you know but within the self structure um you know like the, i i use the the term uh, awakening and and enlightenment um differently so um so you know the awakening is the awakening of of that primordial awareness um, which is eternal and changeless but enlightenment to me is this development process that that um, happens within the self structure that is an unfolding through time so um, so somehow you know what we are as a human being we're 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 this eternal uh, awareness but it's it's um, embedded or you know it's it's it, like in the Upanishads, they talk about the sheaths of of, of the soul or the sheaths of the of the self structure, and so it ha- there are many levels, many layers of mind that um, that sort of in spiral or in, in case, you know, or you know, it's it's like the um, awareness gets caught in this the the illusion of of self, and so the so the self structure and the soul. Um, are, are um, you know, they're changing and, and developing through time, and um, so so that for me, um, you know, there, there's a lot that kicks into gear um, when you have an awakening experience. Um, from my perspective, what's happening is, um, you know, the um, the enlightenment process or development process uh, becomes accelerated. So. Um, so we you know there there's sort of two two aspects to that we we go into the existing self structure and and kind of purify it of our conditioned patterns so we you know we go into our um you know our the the conditioning that we've inherited from society and our biological conditioning and um and we um we learn to um not be um, continuously reacting to those those preferences, which are you know they're just like little programs of craving and aversion that um, you know it's just the response to stimulus that that we've inherited, and that that response to stimulus is sublimated to all different levels of our life. So we're we're going after money, we're going after relationships, we're going after um you know things that will boost our self esteem all the all that stuff is is tied into that conditioning you know and the, and on the deepest root level it's just pure response to stimulus it's just you know wanting what gives us pleasure on the deepest sensory level and avoiding pain at that same level 
um, so that you know so that purification process um, you know is is something that um, is is really important um, once we've had an awakening experience um, you know almost everybody who who awakens will they, they get drawn back into their their condition patterns and that was the case for me as well you know after about two weeks I, I had a, about a, a nice two-week run where I was I was resting in <laughs> Uh, awareness but then bit by bit my my condition patterns came back so you know this purification process um, you know purifying the sankharas that they they talk about in the Buddhist condition which are these these patterns um, is totally necessary if you want to have a purified vessel like your your human body um, to to house that awakened consciousness in a in a more permanent way. So um, so that is an ongoing process. And then um, you know as we as we free our energy from those conditioned pa- patterns, that energy becomes free to explore other aspects of our of the self structure, like you could say the the higher self, um, which. In these ancient teachings, they they speak about that as well. Um, so you know, as human beings, like we're we're mostly existing in our society on the mental and physical level, but we also have um, you know in the Upanishads they they talk about the the energetic level, the pranic level, um, and then there's the the higher mind or insight level. Um, which is, you know, you could you could call it the the archetypal realm or a higher higher intellect level that is it's almost like the um, the template level for for our lives, um, and then there beyond that there's the the causal level, and uh, which which I described a little bit, which is is um, you know it's the the realization of um, uh, you know, in the yogic traditions, when they they talk about sat chitananda, which is uh, um, you know the the bliss of of the truth or the bliss of emptiness, that that is the um, you know sort of the formless or or causeless uh, level of our our self. So um, so as we as we become free of these these old conditioned patterns this energy it's you know the energy when you, if you think about um you know lightning or, or you know any ener- any energy is just like branching patterns you know so it's if you or you think about the a human brain you know it's just made of these these branching patterns and these higher levels of mind are just levels of energy that are branching and exploring, you know, just like higher levels of mind, and um, so, you know, to me that that is another big part of the the development process. That um, so we're we're simultaneously becoming free of conditioning, and we're simultaneously creating new conditioning and subtler conditioning to experience all these aspects of of. Um, human existence that um, we may not even have known existed you know a lot of this stuff before I was meditating I had no idea what was even possible and um, and you know now I know that I don't know you know I know I know there's so much in the unfolding of this development process like I'm I'm, you know I've been blown away many times Um, you know I've had different teachers and they've they've connected me with things that um, you know weren't were not even on my radar at all, and aspects of myself and aspects of existence that are um, you know just totally new. So um, you know I feel you know the the best sort of orientation or attitude to have to to the path you know um, is one of beginner's mind you know and really really accepting that you know the limited mind the limited me doesn't know it can't know um it's actually the obstacle to to knowing or you know or to not even to knowing but you know to the the plugging in to these higher levels of mind you know it's like it ha- it has to surrender 
the, the limited self has to surrender its energy in order to allow it to plug into these higher levels of mind and self. This has been such a t tremendous and profound journey for you, Jan. What do you think, how do you think you're different, I mean, in, in the way that you live your life now as from before, from before you had these experiences? Yeah, um, you know, in some ways, like nothing, nothing changes, you know, like that's the interesting thing, like a lot of, a lot of um, teachers will talk about how, you know, like like before en enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. You know, so mm -hmm. so you know you still you still do all the same things, but um, you know all all of the things that are happening within the self structure are still happening, um, but you know a lot of my life is you know like if i look what's uh, what's happening on a day to day level you know i'm doing a lot of things that are um you know like doing doing meditation retreats and um doing writing working on films like a lot of it is just sort of um you know i i get, i think the way i would describe it is like if i look at myself 20 years ago you know, there there were there were little seeds of things that I, you know, I felt, you know, my soul wanted to be doing, and and um, and yet I would never do them. You know, like playing piano, I would I would never be um, doing the things that I love that that actually nourished my my spirit, and and um, um, and it's because my my self structure was was too busy, you know, doing all the stuff that it wanted to do and you know watching movies or you know um worrying about this or that or you know just the patterns that we we fall into so i would say you know now like the the biggest shift for me is um you know i'm not fighting myself nearly as much like i'm i'm um you know and my default is to do meditation rather than to try and avoid meditation and my my default is more to um just do you know just allow myself to 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 do the things that um that I'm meant to be doing and uh you know I think you know the only measure on the path really is when you look back at your life you know are are you actually suffering less in your life than you were you know previously and so when I when I look at when I started meditation, and you know, and now like the my the amount of suffering that I have in my life is is less, you know, and and I think hopefully I generate less suffering for people around me as well, um, because you know I was I was a pretty I, you know my, I had a very strong ego and I still do I still you know my partner. Tanya um tells me that um you know my my ego construct is like it really is a blessing and a curse you know the the mind is is um you know able to work with all these different things and and um and uh you know talk about different aspects of spirituality and make all these connections but it's it's also always simultaneously creating a facsimile of the truth of the you know of you know it's basically creating an awakened self structure all the time so so one has to be um very vigilant that um you know you don't create some sort of uh spiritual persona and uh and you know create the prison all over again and um i've done that at many points and and um and, you know so i i believe you like you're never beyond anything on this path you're never beyond anything hmm. oh, oh, when when you you talked about um purifying the the patterns and, you know many of the teachers talk about the need for purification 
when you're on a path of connecting to your real self. What do you suggest and offer people as strategies to help purify? And, and, and what is it that we're purifying so we can define what that that which is being purified is? Yeah, well it's 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 very it's very strange because it's it's you. Like you're really purifying yourself of yourself. You know, it's it's a it's a very strange thing that we're doing in meditation. So, you know, and even at a certain point, you know, all these these techniques that that we have in meditation at a certain point even even the technique itself is, you know, every technique is is conditioned, right? Because it's it's a it's something that we learn and we we have it we have it in our mind and within our self structure so even the technique itself at a certain point um has to be dropped um so you know like to answer your question like the the purifying to me like what's what's happening in meditation you know at the samadhi center like we we usually start out with techniques at a at a retreat so we'll we'll use a technique like observing the the natural breath and what happens is um you know in buddhism they they talk about um jhana the, the jhanas or states of meditative absorption so you know the the technique almost is is irrelevant at a certain point like we always start out with a technique that is you know like that makes sense basically like you're dealing with something that is actually real in the present moment so so the breath is is a great example but um but you could be you could be observing the inner energy of the chakras or you could be um you, you know you there there's a million techniques out there you could be doing the vipassana body scan technique or um you could be there are different um techniques where where you note um you know mental phenomena you you put you label mental phenomena so it it doesn't doesn't matter which one of these techniques one of our teachers is really into um you know all different techniques for for different situations and um but the you know the real the stripping away happens when you um you take one technique and you really go deep with it so um so if you you start to observe the natural breath um you you start to come face to face with um you know the hindrances you know so the the hindrances are you know the mind will will start generating thoughts and and um so you you have to start to make an effort to be in the present moment um or other hindrances will come like like tiredness or agitation and these different things and um so when we when we really um you know we make an effort to to just be with the meditation object um we we start to um pull energy out of these these patterns and these these patterns they they call them sankharas which are which are um you know just habit patterns of the mind and um and these sankharas will start to come up to the surface as we're meditating and um and it's just just resistance that's all it is it's just you know the the wiring that is inside of a human being needs to be running it needs to be active in order for the the self structure to exist so um so when we're when we're just sitting with our meditation object we're just sitting with the breath you know we're we're not flowing energy into the old conditioned pattern and and it starts to get agitated it starts to feel like um you know literally like if you if you sit you know for 2 hours or 3 hours without moving your self structure starts to feel like it's dying and um and so it'll these sankharas that will come up will try and move you out of your meditation they'll try and move you off the cushion and um you know it generates aversion in your in your within deep part of your being um so it'll it'll try and try and um interrupt your your meditation and um 
and the meditation, you know, staying with the meditation object, really, you know, if it's the breath, like you're not really actually doing anything in the meditation. You're, you're not, there's no actual activity happening. What you're really doing is just being with, with what is in the moment. And then, you know, these sankaras start to come up and, and you're really just recognizing the craziness that's already happening within the mind. And you, you just let it all come up to the surface. You let it arise and pass away. Whatever, whatever phenomena is, is there, you know, it's authentically there in the moment. You just let it all arise and pass away. And, and as we do that, every, there are many levels of absorption. These, these jhanas that are talked about in, in Buddhism. And jhana just means, um, you know, um, like it's the same word as Zen in Zen Buddhism, actually, or in the yogic tradition, it's, it's dhyana. And, um, you know, every level of jhana or a level of absorption that happens in meditation, there's a simultaneous sort of dropping away of activity of the mind. And there's a, a um, you could say like an energy gets released as well. So there's there's a subjective experience of, of greater presence or concentration and 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 less mind activity at, at every level. And um, you know, so the the first to get through to the first jhana, we we move through these typical hindrances that arise in meditation and um and um you know we just we have to be very persistent and we we don't make it happen it just sort of um happens as we we just let go of our activity we let go of any self or any any doing that is happening in the meditation so I would imagine what you are describing from your experience and your studies is the process that is being recognized when all these studies are being done, the functional brain scans are being done and seeing how the brain is altered, how people have less anxiety, improved sleep. When we're less agitated, when we're more at peace, when we're literally rewiring our brain through these practices of just being and observing, we actually are then experiencing the manifestations of more of a greater balance, more life energy flowing through us, just the ability to be more present and, and ultimately happy. Yes. Yes. Yeah, our happiness that that comes through um you know, through meditation is not contingent on anything you know it's it's mm-hmm. just it's it's you know when when the energy that is inside of us is just flowing freely and it's not engaged in a pattern you know because these self patterns are always they're always trying to get something they're always trying to get more you know and it's always projected outside of ourselves so um so that self structure it, it is nothing but a a series of, of preferences, you know, wanting one thing or another, and and these behaviors of trying to get them. So so when all of that stops, you know, when that that whole system of trying to get more stops, and that energy is just present and and just free, you know, we're just you're just being in the moment, and that is is happiness. That's that's bliss. That's the transcendent bliss that is, is spoken about in all these traditions and it has no purpose it has no object other than just to be to be what it is mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and so there there's there's nothing to attain there's no um there there are no conditions for that um that need to be Fulfilled. Yeah, you don't have to purchase something, or you don't have to find the right person, or you don't have to have the perfect meal to be happy. Yeah. It's just yeah. your nature. Yeah, it's just our. It's exactly true. It's our our true nature is just that happiness. And um, you know, when you when you see a, like a little kid, you know, who's really really happy, you know, they're they're not. You know, sometimes like you know, the simplest things can just be joyful and. Um, so it's it's not a you know it's it's not 
anything very profound in that sense but but it but it is profound because it's you know when when we can let go of the egoic agenda then we we do we receive everything and it's it's always already there but it's it's like we just have to stop you know we have to stop grasping and um experience this moment differently just experience this moment in a way that is not being mediated by this self structure you know i have so many questions and some of them are, are, are will take us really deep and i don't think we really have enough time so so i think maybe i'll just switch the conversation to um to the to the documentary you made so the inner worlds, outer worlds, and, and as I said earlier in, in the introduction, I, I just highly recommend people watch this four-part documentary and uh, and just take it in, just absorb it. There, I mean, there's so much information there. You, the mind can't totally comprehend what is being shared, but I think you get it on other levels, and it's just so beautifully done. So do you want to just talk a little bit? We don't have a lot of time left Dan, so maybe just a, a little bit um, about how this came about to create this very, uh, I mean, it's not just profound, but the amount of work that went into bringing all these pieces of wisdom from all these traditions together in a coherent way was amazing to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's the whole filmmaking process for me is very mysterious. Um, like I started out in... in uh, you know, in the television industry and making sort of cookie cutter TV shows. And what's what's happened now is, you know, it's the exact opposite of that. I really, I don't, you know, it is very mysterious how it works. And I, I you know, with these films, I just start working. And, you know, with that film in particular, like I had hours and hours and hours of stuff that I created and I, I threw out, probably five films during the creati- creation of it and um and it's just purely exploration and being being willing to explore something and then let it go and um you know the whole the whole thing really started as a as a powerpoint that I was creating for a little meditation class that I was doing and then it just you know, it just kept growing. There was an energy around it, and people were responding to it, and and um, it just it just kept growing. And um, and you know, to me, it is very mysterious. Like when I when I started this process, um, you know, I felt like I'd I'd had some insights in my my practice, and and I wanted to share them. But then, as I as as I started, um, you know, really exploring and researching and connecting with all these different tr- traditions, it just got more and more mysterious. And I realized, you know, it was like this ever ever deepening rabbit hole that I was going down. And and it it just seems now like the more I do these films, the more there is to, <laughs> to make a film about. And and it's it's not, you know, I don't feel like. Um, there will be ever any any end to it um you know but for me personally on my own journey like to be in the flow of that to be to allow that to come through is you know there's no place i would rather be it's like being in the cathedral it's like being in you know the place where i can work with with sound and light and and um and it you know it it is truly an exploration for me you know i don't i don't sit down with the stuff and have any sense that i have something to teach or or you know something that i want to convey i i feel like i'm you know i'm connecting to what these these great teachers have have all connected to and um you know there there are countless beings who have embodied these teachings much better than than I have or or ever will um and and it's all coming from this the same source um but um you know in terms of my own path it's um you know it's it it is what what connects my i guess my inner world with with 
the outer world. You know, literally, the the film is a bridge mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. to to bridge those two worlds. Well, I cannot recommend it highly enough, and it's wonderful that it's found its way onto Amazon Prime. And and to YouTube. I mean, you can just go into YouTube and do a search for inner worlds, outer worlds, and you'll find all the four parts of that amazing documentary you made. So I'm encouraging everybody to check it out. I, I think everyone will be profoundly transformed, if not healed, by watching what you've created. So I'm um, so grateful to you for doing that. And, and before we kind of come to the end, we only have a couple more minutes, but can you just share a little bit about the Samadhi Center? People want to know more about it and what you sure. do Sure. So um, the Samadhi Center is um, really um, a place to do meditation and self-inquiry. Um, and I, I see meditation and self-inquiry as really one thing, um, you know, part of one continuum, basically. So, um, so the way the, the way I teach it at the center is, um, you know, usually starting out with techniques that will take you um, into less and less doing, like taking taking you to, to your stillness, um, to the point where you you um, hopefully will have an an opportunity for um, uh, awareness to to awaken to itself, and um, you know, so it's really it's just a container. Um, it's I'm basically doing what the Vipassana centers are doing, um, the Zen centers, or you know, um, the yoga ashrams. Um, it's it's all sort of the same kind of techniques, but um, I just have a very eclectic approach, and I don't really subscribe to any one particular tradition. And um, so people can come for a weekend retreat for ten days. Um, a uh, ten day retreat is is a great way to really um you, you know if you really want to get inside the your conditioning and really get grounded in a meditation practice um it can be a, a great way to do it so let me just spell samadhi for people who may not know how it's spelled it's s a m a d h i dot dot c a for canada because Stan yeah, that's right. You live in Canada. So it's samadhi.ca, the website. And if you want to learn more, and just have a look. It's a beautiful center. Did you create that? Did you design that? Um, it's uh, sort of, yeah. Um, it was built about three years ago. Um, so, yeah, and it was it was sort of designed specifically for meditation. Um, and we, we do a lot of um, uh, sound stuff there as well, like meditation with sound. Um, if you go to the site, you'll see um, images of large gongs and things there. So um, these, a lot of these sound tools are fantastic for connecting people with their, their inner world and their inner energy, especially if they've never really felt it before. So. Well, well, you've created some amazing things, and that creative energy just keeps flowing through you. So I'm excited to see what comes next, and uh, and I just want to thank you for the wonderful work you've been doing and for your time today and helping to keep us all inspired and connected to our inner world. So thank you, Dan Schmidt. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a great conversation, and uh, to everyone listening, thank you. This, uh, this wonderful conversation has been with um, Daniel Schmidt, who has created a beautiful documentary, Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds, for free on um, YouTube or Amazon Prime. It's probably in other places, but that's, those are the two easily accessed. And um, Daniel, just thank you so much for everything you've been doing. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And to all of you listening, thank you for joining me today. And uh, until we meet again next week, may your week be filled with love, peace, and happiness. Bye for now.